another Under the Night Sky. My name is Robin. Tonight we're going to be exploring the constellation of Capricornus the Sea Goat. I'll talk about how to find Capricornus, some deep sky objects located in the constellation, and a couple of the myths associated with the Sea Goat. By late September, the sun will be setting after 7. By 8.15, you might be able to see Capricornus, but this is a faint constellation. If you wait a bit, by 9 o'clock, it will be a little higher in the sky and darker, making it easier to see in the south, southeastern sky. This constellation never gets very far above the horizon. Capricornus is one of the 12 zodiacal constellations. Zodiacal constellations lie along the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun and planets through the sky. Capricornus is a mythical creature that is half goat and half fish. This is a bit difficult to see in these stars, so instead we look for a triangle or arrowhead shape. The name Capricornus is Latin for horned goat, with capra meaning goat and cornus meaning horn. The name sea goat comes from a Greek myth about the god Pan turning himself into a half goat, half fish. We'll talk more about Pan later. On the left is an actual photo of Capricornus taken by Phil Hoyle, one of our Astronomy Club members. As you can see, the constellation is a little difficult to pick out. On the right, I have added lines to help you see it. There is one constellation that I've shared in a previous Under the Night Sky that can help you locate Capricornus. Sagittarius the Archer is to the south and west of Capricornus. Use the teapot asterism to help you find the sea goat. There are also two bright planets in the constellation right now, which may help you find it. The first is Jupiter on the east side of the constellation. And then we have Saturn on the west side. Jupiter is the brighter of the two. Saturn will remain in Capricornus through 2021. Jupiter will stay in Capricornus until mid-December when it moves into Aquarius. As I said earlier, the stars of Capricornus are faint, but there is one, actually two stars, I'd like to tell you about. They are called Algidi, and they are at the western tip of Capricornus. The name Algidi is Arabic and means the kid. It is one of the prettiest double stars in the sky. Algidi is made up of Alpha 1 Capricorni, a magnitude 4.3 star located 690 light years away, and Alpha 2 Capricorni, a magnitude 3.6 star located 109 light years away. I've talked about magnitude before. It's the measure of a star's brightness. The lower the number, the brighter the star. These stars are close in magnitude and to our eye look very similar in brightness. Both are yellow giants and both are themselves double stars. They form an optical double, meaning they just happen to be along the same line of sight for us here on Earth. They are not bound together by gravity. It's fairly easy to see both stars with the naked eye, meaning you don't need binoculars or a telescope to see them, but they do look nice in binoculars. Now let's look at some deep sky objects. This is the location of M30, a globular cluster. This illustration shows the fundamental architecture of the Milky Way galaxy, a spiral disk, a central bulge, and a diffuse halo of stars and globular clusters. Globular clusters like M30 are mostly found in the galactic halo. Globulars are the largest and most massive type of star cluster mainly populated by old stars that are very tightly bound by gravity, giving them their spherical shape and high concentrations of stars toward their centers. M30 contains several hundred thousand stars and is located about 28,000 light years from Earth. It's estimated to be 13 billion years old, making this cluster almost as old as the universe itself. The cluster is orbiting in a direction opposite the Milky Way's rotation. This suggests that it was captured by the Milky Way during an encounter with a dwarf satellite galaxy sometime in the past. 
It's believed that the central density of M30 may exceed 30,000 stars like our sun per cubic light year. This is one of the highest density areas in the galaxy. Such an extremely dense nucleus is indicative of a core collapse, a process where the cluster literally falls in on itself. The technical term is gravothermal catastrophe. M30 experienced a core collapse a few thousand million years ago. One result of the core collapse is the creation of two populations of stars called blue stragglers. These are massive bright stars, billions of years old, that should have evolved into white dwarf stars long ago. Blue stragglers are thought to form in one of two ways. On the left, we see a smaller star pulling matter from an aging red giant companion star. On the right, after a couple hundred million years, the red giant star has burned out and collapsed into a white dwarf star. The companion star, acting like a vampire siphoning hydrogen off the red giant all those years, is now more massive, hotter, brighter, and bluer. The second way to create a blue straggler is for two stars to collide. This is an artist concept of a close binary star merging to form a blue straggler. This merger results in a more massive star with nuclear fusion occurring at a faster rate, causing it to burn hotter, brighter, and bluer. So even though M30 is one of the oldest globular clusters in the Milky Way, and probably the universe, it contains many young-looking hot blue stars. The next deep sky object is the Hickson Compact Group 87, or HCG 87. The group lies about 400 million light years away and is made up of at least three galaxies. The large edge-on spiral galaxy, located bottom center, a large elliptical galaxy, the bright round object just off the right side of the edge on spiral, and the spiral galaxy at the top of the image. The small spiral near the center is thought to be much farther away and not a part of this group. The spiral at the top is experiencing abnormally high rates of star formation, indicating that it is interacting with at least one of the other two galaxies. The elliptical and the edge on spiral galaxies both have active nuclei, indicating they have feeding supermassive black holes, and they are connected by a stream of stars and dust, indicating that they are also interacting. It's predicted that these galaxies will merge millions of years from now, creating one giant elliptical galaxy. Our next object is Palomar 12, another globular cluster that lies about 60,000 light years away. The cluster was first identified in the Palomar Sky Survey, which gave it its name. It's not like other Milky Way globular clusters. The stars of this globular are around 30% younger than those of other Milky Way globular clusters, and its motion suggests that it was not originally a part of the Milky Way. It's been determined that Palomar 12 was once a member of the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical Galaxy, a small satellite galaxy that closely orbits the Milky Way. During a past close encounter, the resulting gravitational tides ripped Palomar 12 from its home. It's estimated that the tidal capture of these stars happened some 1.7 billion years ago, and it has been living on the outskirts of the Milky Way's halo ever since. Palomar 12 is associated with the Sagittarius stream, a long, complex structure made of stars that wrap around the Milky Way galaxy in an orbit that nearly crosses the galactic poles. It consists of stars tidally stripped from the Sagittarius dwarf elliptical galaxy, a result of the two galaxies merging over a period of billions of years. Our last deep sky object is NGC 6907 a large open face spiral located 120 million light years from Earth. NGC 6907 is considered a grand design spiral galaxy, a galaxy with prominent and well-defined spiral arms that wrap far around the galaxy. 
The inner arms are bright and they have knots forming a bar, making this a barred spiral galaxy. 6907 interacts with galaxy NGC 6908, which is superimposed on the eastern arm of 6907. It's the bright spot on the left arm. It was believed for some time that 6908 was actually a part of 6907, but when it was observed in the infrared, it became apparent that it was a different galaxy. 6908 passed through the disk of 6907 about 5 million years ago, leaving a gas bridge between the two. Let's move on to some of the mythology associated with this constellation. The constellation seems to have originated with the Sumerians and then passed to the Babylonians and then Greeks, Romans, and others. Capricornus is in the area of the sky that since ancient times has been associated with water and called the sea. Capricornus was seen as the Mesopotamian god Ea, who was half fish and half goat. He was god of the seas as well as god of knowledge, wisdom, magic, and medical science. He lived in the sea, but would come out every day to watch over the land. When on land, he would become a goat to make it easier to move around. He brought culture and science to mankind. The Sumerian equivalent for Ea was Enki, high god of the sweet waters and intellect, of wisdom and medicine, and keeper of all secret and magical knowledge of life and immortality. The Egyptians kept the image of the sea goat, but saw it as their god Toth, god of wisdom. He brought knowledge, writing, and wisdom to mankind. For some, these stars form a pattern resembling two goat horns. The stars Deneb, Algidi, and Nashira make one horn tip, and Algidi and Dabi make the other horn tip. Omega Capricorni marks where the horns come out of the goat's head. As I mentioned earlier, Algidi is an Arabic word meaning the kid. The Arabs called this constellation the young goat, and the Belarusians called it the wild goat. The Romanians see just a goat in these stars. A popular belief is that when lightning is seen in the horn of the she-goat, rain is sure to follow. In Greek mythology, Capricornus is associated with the god Pan. At a time when the younger gods were at war with the giants of old, they fled into Egypt where they were hunted by the monster Typhon. Typhon found the gods feasting and bathing by the river Nile. To escape, the gods changed themselves into animals so that they could run and hide. Pan was a very excitable god and was so afraid of Typhon that he jumped into the river before he finished transforming himself into an animal shape. The part of his body out of the water became a goat, and the part of his body that was in the water became a fish. It's said that Zeus was so amused by Pan's animal form that he created a constellation in the likeness of the goat fish so everyone would remember Pan's escape. Another story tells that Capricornus is Amalthea, the goat that nursed baby Zeus when he was being hidden from his father Kronos. And just as a side note, one of Jupiter's moons is named Amalthea. Well, that's it for this Under the Night Sky. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed exploring Capricornus the sea goat with me. Join me next month when we explore the constellation of Perseus the Hero. Thank you.